What's up guys, Rick here, and this is an early preview for the Charles Schwab Challenge. That's right, we are now, I guess, a week away from being in Charles Schwab Challenge week, the PGA Tour coming back. We are oh so close. And while there are no salaries out for fantasy at the moment, and there are a few betting markets that are trickling out, what I wanted to do is at least create a video of a first look at this field because we have a lot of guys that are committed to the field. Also, there is some unique strategy around this three month layoff and how we are going to deal with that and how we're going to weigh all of that. So I just want to chat through uh, some of those things before, you know, next week we get into salaries, pricing, um, you know, head to head matchups, three balls, who's value, who's not all that stuff, uh, because we don't we don't have a lot of information to go on, but we do have enough. Now, throughout this video, I will be showing you uh, some of the tools from my site, rickrungood.com, which is probably uh, one of the largest golf databases on the face of the earth with a bunch of uh, tools for fantasy, for betting, and just for research in general. If you want to look up uh, historic tournaments and uh, player trends and things like that. So I will be giving away. A, uh, a subscription or two, let's do two subscriptions to my site, rickrungood.com. And there are two ways to enter that drawing. First off, if you're listening on the podcast, which I highly encourage you to do, uh, leave a five-star rating and review, say something nice about the show and leave me a way to get in touch with you, preferably your Twitter handle. Otherwise, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, like the video, make sure you're subscribed because we do a ton of videos. There's uh, fantasy previews, there's betting stuff, there's going to be golf news interviews and things like that in general. Uh, so make sure you're subscribed to the YouTube channel as well, the Rick Run Good YouTube channel. Like this video and comment below with who you think is going to win the Charles Schwab Challenge. Uh, all right, that's how you get entered into the draw. I'll announce on Monday who the winners are, and you can access all of the tools for a month. All right, let's jump into the two weeks away. I usually say this week's Charles Schwab Challenge. It's next week's Charles Schwab Challenge. If you are watching on the video version of this preview, you're looking at the updated cheat sheet on Rick Run Good. Dot com, which I, I, I like this a lot more now because it allows me and allows you to do research basically as early as you would want. It has loaded in every player who has any results for 2020, and then you can update the tournament history for any tournament that you want. It doesn't have to just be for this week. So this was critical for me for this season. So now what I've also been able to do is change the tournament to Charles Schwab Challenge so I can get the tournament history for everyone. And then I've loaded in the committed field thus far. So I'll toggle that button. And there's 125 guys at last count that have committed to this field. Uh, this is as of last night. So it would be as of like like uh, Sunday, May 31st-ish, okay? So recording this uh, in the morning on June 1st. So 125 golfers are committed. Obviously, this field is going to change. There's a chance that some guys drop out. That's probably unlikely, but there is uh, there are definitely going to be more guys added to this field. But the first thing you'll notice is this is an absolutely stacked field. Uh, six of the top seven players in the world are here. Adam Scott is the only guy who will not be teeing it up at Colonial. Uh, Rory McIlroy, John Rahm, Brooks Kepka, Justin Thomas, Dustin Johnson, and Patrick Reed are all here. That's six of the top seven. Then you get basically everyone from 12 to 20. Xander's here, Bryson here, past champion, uh, Justin Rose is here. I mean, it's, it's just an absolutely stacked field. Clearly, these guys are chomping at the bit to get back out onto the golf course. So that leaves us with, what do we know about these golfers and their the current state of their game? And the answer is generally going to be not much. Um, I think that I will I will not necessarily be diving too much into what these guys have done on Instagram or on Twitter over the course of 
the last three months. Um, I will be looking at a lot of long-term form. You know, who who are the best players? I still expect the be best players to rise to the top. If I've seen anything about a golfer, like like we know Rory played played okay. He got better at tailor-made driving relief. We know Ricky Fowler played pretty well. Um, you know, kind of looking at it from that perspective, you know, I can make assumptions of who I think is practicing a lot. I assume Sung Jay is practicing a lot. I've seen Bryson on Twitch every night lifting and, and working on his numbers. I assume he's been hitting a lot of golf balls. But how that all of that is going to translate to week one with a three-week layoff is it's going to be difficult to quantify. So I don't think you should be tying yourself in knots trying to determine like, oh, can so-and-so keep their good form going? I'm just going to kind of say, hey, better players are, are, are better. Uh, I'm going to kind of act like we didn't have this three months because like it's difficult to, to apply what someone has been doing to one guy and what they what they haven't been doing to another. It's just it's it's a really challenging game. So I'm going to kind of look at this just like I would a normal week. And you can see like obviously Rory McIlroy probably getting a, a, a break was terrible for him. You know, he was he, I think he has seven straight top fives rolling into this event now he's playing colonial for the first time uh justin thomas playing colonial for the first time dustin johnson playing it for the first time at least in recent memory at least in the last five years i'm not sure if he's played it when it was like the crown plaza classic or whatever it was before it was named the charles schwab so um no, he doesn't have five years worth of, of data or any any data within the last five years in in my cheat sheet here so um I, i'm just going to also, I think I think there's a few things. Uh, the level of volatility, I think, ramps up. Um, so if you ever wanted to fade some of the top guys, uh, especially if they're going to be higher owned, I think now is the time. Just because there are so many unknowns, uh, we don't have tournament results coming in. Like like yes, Rory McIlroy is 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 the best, but how is that going to translate off of a three month break? So I think in general, you want to accept and embrace a lot more volatility, uh, the, f the first couple of weeks of golf returning, um, and, and seeing how these results are coming through in the same way that I think that, um, a, a hiatus, a break hurts some guys. I think it hurts Rory McIlroy, who was scorching hot. Um, uh, I think it hurts Bryson DeChambeau, who, you know, was on the verge of winning a fifth, a second, a fourth coming into this, a guy that I am so optimistic on for the rest of the year. Uh, he's, he's literally breaking the game. These guys were just trending towards wins and they might be able to continue to keep that going. But I think there are key guys that will actually benefit from this three month break. And they're guys that were uh, essentially struggling. Uh, someone like a Brooks Kepka. I I'm going to take a wait and see approach on Brooks Kepka, who didn't play well, you know, missed the cut at the Honda, didn't play particularly well at Genesis or API, 47th at API, 43rd at Genesis. He's someone that, remember, he had that knee surgery. Um, it would have been at the end of 2019. He has knee surgery. He told us, you know, he's he wasn't 100%. Um, he was knocking off the rust over at, uh, at Shriners when I saw him at Shriners. It's it's just like, for someone like him, who time is his friend, especially when you're coming back from a, a surgery and trying to get your get back in shape, like time is his friend. I could absolutely see him using this time to get right, get healthy, and follow up his second place finish here at the Charles Schwab Challenge from two years ago, which is the only time he's played it. So he's someone who's interesting. Um, Justin Rose is incredibly interesting. I'm, I'm not going to take a wait and see approach on Justin Rose. I'm basically pushing the chips into the middle on Justin Rose and saying, I, I trust you to get this right. So let's go over to the strokes gain database here because I want to pull up Justin Rose and, um, talk through what we've seen from him. So Rosie, of course, at the end of 2018, and I can actually scroll down even further here. If you're looking on the video, what I'm showing is this guy is just an unbelievably elite ball striker dating back year over year. I mean, his off the tee game is sublime. His approach game is not as good, but still very, very good. He ascends to the number one player in the world at the end of 2018, 
finally started to figure out the putter, you can see right here, look at this chart. He is basically a, a completely neutral putter. This is a running total. So he is essentially a dead break even putter from 2015 all the way to March of 2018. March of 2018, he finally crosses over into the positive of running strokes gain putting. He learned, he figured out the putter. So that is what ascends him to the world's number one. And he basically has eight great months at the end of 2018 where he wins this event. He wins the Fort Worth Invitational. That's what it was called in 2018. He piles up top tens at Memorial, the U.S. Open. He goes second, second, fourth in the playoff events. Dell Technology, BMW Championship, Tour Championship, and he's the number one player in the world. He just, it's, his game is firing on all cylinders. And then he signs with Hanma, a Japanese golf manufacturer that doesn't have a huge catalog of top tier players as in, as as uh, on their on their roster. And a lot of people said he was kind of selling out, taking the big money, and um, he he silenced them. You know, his second start using the Hanma sticks, he won at Farmers Insurance. But then you can see here the end of 2019. Uh, from basically June-ish, July on, was a disaster for Justin Rose. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of his last nine events, he lost strokes off the tee. If I scroll back, outside of those, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, there were only eight events from 2015 to the end of 2020 that Justin Rose lost strokes off the tee, and then he did it in seven of his last nine. That is obviously unfathomable for a player of his caliber. So where I'm going with this huge rant is just a couple of weeks ago, just before the player, actually, I guess it was a couple of months ago at this point, uh, just before the hiatus, uh, Rose drops the Hanma sticks and he goes back to his tailor-made clubs. Now you're getting a situation where a guy has a three-month stretch to dial in any clubs that he wants, whether he goes back to his old tailor-mades, whether he goes back to uh, he goes back to tailor-made and gets refitted, whatever it is. He now has three months to work through this without any PGA events instead of having to figure it out on the fly, which a lot of guys have to do when they make uh, club changes. So now you've got Rose, who has had three months to prepare for this event, a world-class caliber player whose asset has depreciated over the course of the last six or seven or eight months, going back to a place that he that he's won at in the past. So that, to me, I am a massive buy low on Justin Rose guy, and I also uh, like like love him right away. You know, I don't need to wait and see like I like I need to do for Kepka or Dustin Johnson or maybe even someone like a Jordan Spieth. I am all in on Rose right now out of the gate. Um, I, I mentioned Jordan Spieth. He continues to be incredibly interesting. Um, I can pull up his his strokes, strokes gain database here too. We can look through Jordan Spieth together. But um, obviously it has now been almost, we are, we are closing in on three years since Jordan Spieth's last victory, the 2017 Open Championship. I have to scroll pretty far to get there, um, where, you know, he goes out, he wins the, the Open Championship, and it's been three years since that victory. Now, I always thought uh, that Jordan Spieth needed a, um, a, a hard reset, essentially. And you can see, look at his strokes, his running strokes gain total. You know, ascension, ascension, ascension. Um, gets to here, you know, 158 total strokes gained. That is in May of 2018. And he's basically been dropping ever since. Uh, kind of similar to his strokes gain approach. He, he really just levels off and it gets worse. Now, the putter, of course, has picked him up. The putter has gone absolutely nuclear since, let's call it, June of 2018. Uh, that has kept him in a lot of events, but it hasn't been enough for him to find victory. I always thought he needed a hard reset. Um, I thought that when you are a world-class player, when you're a former number one, when you have literally had one of, I mean, his his 2010s decade, even though he only had five or six years of it, 
was one of the best uh, decades, well, almost ever. His 2015 season was pro- might may, might have been the best season ever. Um, when you have that skill set and you have fallen off as far as you have now ranked, I don't know, 60-something in the world, he's ranked 56th in the world. I thought he needed a hard reset, whether that is whether that is changing his swing coach, whether it is changing his caddy, or doing both. And that is not a knock on Cameron McCormick. It's not a knock on Michael Greller. It is just sometimes you need a different voice. And I thought that I thought what Spieth was going to do was basically get through Augusta, go one last one last crack at Augusta with Greller specifically. And if that didn't go well potentially part ways now that the masters has been moved to november like maybe they want to give it one more go there like i don't know i i think i think that was a natural tipping point for spieth to be three wins or three years without a win through the event that uh you know really has defined his career and split with greller if he needed a hard reset now that's all pure speculation for me but now he's kind of in no man's zone. I don't know where he's at now. If if something like that happens in November, maybe like this is really hard. I'm, I I I would assume Spieth is. Uh, I mean, he outworks everybody, right? He 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 wants this more than more than anybody else. So, if I'm all in on Rosie immediately, if I'm playing wait and see on Kepka and DJ, Spieth is kind of in the middle for me. I will I will get some exposure to him, especially at a place. I mean, I can pull this up. Um, Jordan Spieth. Here he is. the The record at this event, which is obvious. I mean, it's had like ten names. It's it's been um, it's been Charles Schwab Challenge. It's been Fort Worth Open, Fort Worth Invitational. It's been Dean and Deluca. It's been Crown Plaza, whatever. The record for Spieth is this. Uh, in, he wins in 2016 and bookends that in 15 and 17 with second place finishes. Third place, uh, I'm sorry, 32nd place in 2018 and eighth in 2019. You will not find better course history out of anybody at this event, uh, at least in the last five years, than, than Jordan Speed. So uh, I'm like medium in on him and I'm more in on him at the Charles Schwab Challenge, then I might be at a course that is not such a good fit for him. Um, speaking of course history, Kevin Na pops off here, and there is something we need to discuss about Kevin Na. And I'm going to pull up Kevin's, um, I'm going to pull up his his strokes gain results, but only at this event. So let's do Kevin Na, and I'm actually going to select, um, so this is Charles Schwab, Crown Plaza, Dean and DeLuca, and I had one more name, Fort Worth Invitational. Um, so here are, uh, what was in 16 and 17? Was it called something different? Let me see here real quick. I might be missing one. I'm going to consolidate these so that they're all, uh, it's only one click that you have to do. Kevin Na wins this last year. He's your defending champion. Fourth the previous year. He had another top 10. That's what I'm showing you is top 10s here in 2015. And uh, the only concern, there, there's there, the concern about Kevin Na, and I don't know if this is really a concern, is that when he pops off, is um, he does it with the putter. So I can I can show you this here. Uh, his wins, obviously, or actually, I guess I should sort by Kevin Na, are are some of the wackiest things I've ever seen. Right, like he's the basically the only. I think he's the only guy in my database who won a golf tournament by losing strokes tee to green because he gained 14 strokes on the green to win, uh, to win Shriner. So uh, I believe he's the only guy in my database that has actually won losing strokes gained tee to green. It's pretty remarkable. Um, but th- the good news is I-, I don't think, okay, we talk a lot about volatility. We talk a lot about upside. That There is a, a contingent of... Guys like me that come on here and, and, and talk golf or, or you know, I try not to tout, right? I'm, I'm about the research. I'm about trying to give you information and data and you can make your own decisions. But what we the, the crutch that a lot of us use is to say, well, he's got upside. Uh, he's a GPP play because you can justify almost anything by saying that, right? Oh, he's a GPP play. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work out, you can say, oh, well, yeah, I said he was high risk or whatever. That's a crutch. Uh, there are actually 
a few guys who have legitimate upside. Upside meaning winning upside or top three upside. Two of them that pop into the top of my head are both named Kevin, actually. So it's Kevin Streelman is one of them. And it's Kevin Na. And Kevin Na is the poster boy for embracing volatility in a golfer. Uh, because he has won, dating back to this event last year, now twice in his last 18 events. Think about the other guys who have won twice in their last 18 events. The list is very small. Um, I'm not even sure, has Rory done it? Yeah, so Rory wins Tour Championship. He wins RBC Canadian. Uh, and also he won, um, so this is the Strokes Gain database. So I should actually go to his golfer profile. But um, a the WGC event in, in China, right? Didn't he, didn't he win that? Uh, who else? I mean, Rom, I guess, would have done it um, because he won. One of them was Hero World Challenge. I'm just trying to think of like there. There is just so, the point is there are so few guys on tour that can win twice in an 18 event stretch, and Kevin Na is one of them. Now, let's be real. Like it, the rest of it might not be all that great. Right. I mean, you, you're you're the reason he doesn't win all the time is he's not named Rory McIlroy. Right. Like you're going to get a 36th place finish. You're going to get him missing the cut at Genesis and missing the cut at Waste Management and missing the cut at Safeway, like a, f a field that he should probably be one of the better guys in. Um, but it's that it's that pop off ability. And when he pops off, he wins. And that is very, very rare on the PGA Tour. So, listen, I I. I think Kevin Na is fine, but do not be confused about when, when guys will say, you know, oh, he's got high upside. Like, what does that mean? Kevin Na actually has it. Um, and, and few guys on the PGA Tour that are not the big names that you think about. Because think about who wins golf tournaments. The best players in the world win the like, vast majority of the golf tournaments. Now, you get – we all remember when – Max Homa pops off and wins Wells Fargo. We all remember when uh, Nate Lashley, you know, gets in what mo Wednesday night or whatever and goes wire to wire at Rocket Mortgage, right? Like we remember the 500 to one, the 250 to one, the whatever. Um, Keith Mitchell winning Honda. It doesn't happen all that often. The vast majority of the wins are the top guys. Now, some guys, the usually in fantasy DFS, like a a really good high upside finish is like, hey. Um, you know, this guy finished third and he was $6,700. That's awesome. But few guys can win like Kevin Na can win. Um, all right. I think we might put a, put a pin in it there. I, I think, you know, the, the young guys are going to be incredibly interesting. Morikawa and Scotty Scheffler. Scheffler played great on the mini tours. Um, well, I mean, played well enough, right? I mean, he didn't, he didn't win the Scottsdale open, which is a, uh, a mini tour event, but he was he was right there. I think he was in the final group on 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 the final round. Um, there's also guys like like here. Okay, so I think like Max Homa and Joel Damon. Um, so I just mentioned Joel Damon, but he was he was fifth and fifth coming into this, or, or at the at the at the end of uh, the PGA Tour. I don't want to call it season before we went on break, but Max Homa, you know, five straight top twenty fives. Uh, don't forget about him. You know, I think some guys that. As like a lot of times in fantasy, a lot of times in our world, guys catch momentum. You know, they they pile up two top tens in a row, and they catch this momentum. I think now that we haven't seen anyone, that momentum kind of goes away. Like someone like a Daniel Berger might is is, is probably going to be pretty interesting this week. You know, someone I, I avoided him towards the end of pre <laughs> pre break uh, because his his ownership was getting so high. But it, it was warranted, you know, it was 29th, then 9th, 5th, and 4th. He was trending all over the place, uh, didn't play, I guess he didn't qualify for, or no, I guess he didn't play, uh, or either both, but API, Arnold Palmer Invitational. Um, so I'm wondering what the collective memory of Daniel Berger is, right? I mean, so this is what's going to be really interesting, is it the first couple of weeks are going to be ownership situations. Um, additionally... What I think is going to happen, because there is so little data coming out of this, uh, that whatever happens in week one, 
everyone will use as gospel in week two. Uh, if 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 Rory misses the cut at the Charles Schwab challenge, there might be people like, ah, well, I'm going to wait and see on Rory, right? He's really rusty. We got to figure this out. Or like if Christian Bezoidenhut continues his good stretch of golf and like wins Charles Schwab challenge, like a lot of people are going to roster him the next week. Like it's weird. We're all going to be dealing with one week's worth of data in week two. So stay even, stay cool. We'll talk through each and every week in a big way. Um, This is the early look at the Charles Schwab Challenge. Next week, I will get back to the schedule that kind of we know and love, right? Which is like a DFS video on on Monday. Um, I might combine on Tuesday the one and done and uh, the betting preview. Uh, so that'll probably be Tuesday. I'll probably get, you know, like Eric Patterson to talk golf with me on Wednesday, something like that. But there will be plenty of uh, content and, and a lot of stuff going on. Uh, and, and golf is back. It's back, baby. Yeah, let's let's do it. Um, all right, I will catch you on Twitter. It is at Rick Run Good. See you guys later.